Good morning. This is Jack Lavin, President and CEO of the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining our third annual State of the Mid-Market event. I'd like to say a special thanks to our Mid-Market Chicago program sponsors, BDO, BMO Harris Bank, Aon, and Colliers International. I also want to thank our partners from the National Center for the Mid Middle Market. You'll hear from them in just a moment. The fact that you're tuning into this morning's session via webinar is another reminder of this challenging time that we find ourselves in. No facet of daily life has been untouched by the COVID-19 pandemic. And though the report we are unveiling today will need to be considered in light of what's happening now, we felt it was important to release the, this data nonetheless. What you will come to appreciate as we go through it is the outsized impact that middle market companies have on our region's economy and workforce. It's worth reminding the business community, policymakers, and the general public about this impact because it's these very companies that might be most vulnerable in the weeks and months ahead. I want to quickly say that we are advocating in City Hall with the State of Illinois and Congress and every level of government to provide companies of all sizes and industries with the relief packages you need now and in the long term. The Chamber is here for you. Let us know how we can support you and what you most urgently need. If you have issues or needs, please email me at jlavin at chicagolandchamber.org. Also, stay tuned to our website, www.chicagolandchamber.org, for updates and new webinars that will be coming soon. We have some great presenters with us today who will help us put all of this into context for us. We'll start with our researchers from the National Center for the Middle Market located in Columbus, Ohio. The National Center for the Middle Market is a national center of excellence that provides knowledge, leadership, data analysis, insights, and innovative research on the middle market economy. We are joined by their executive director, Thomas Stewart, and managing director, Doug Farron, who will walk us through the report. After, we'll get to hear from Mike Stritch, Chief Investment Officer, and John Borchard, Senior Energy Materials and Industry Analyst at BMO Wealth Management. For those of you who are joining via Zoom, you can submit a question in writing at any point during the webinar using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We, have, we will have some time at the end for questions and we'll get to as many as possible. And now, Tom and Doug, take it over. Tom and Doug, can you be sure to unmute? screen to unmute. There you are. There okay, no. Thank you. Hey, it's, it, this is Tom Stewart. I'm the executive director of the National Center for the Middle Market. And Doug, why don't you say a word or two so people can hear your voice and then I'll pick up the baton for a minute. Yeah, good morning, everyone. It's nice being with you all today. So I'm in New York. Doug's in Columbus. We're all scattered around wherever we are in all of this, but we're all together with the um, Chicagoland Chamber, which is one of the places where we like to be. Uh, if you could move the slide forward a little bit. Um, uh, and one, one more beyond that. Uh, the National Center for the Middle Market, as Jack said, is a research organization based at The Ohio State University, the Fisher College of Business. Um, we exist to help people understand the importance of mid-sized companies and to help mid-sized companies get insights and knowledge so that they can perform better than they have before. If you'll advance the slide. Um, the, the middle market, when we set out to, to create the National Center for the Middle Market, there are a lot of different definitions of it. And the way we defined it from, from the get-go was to say, let's you know, use Occam's razor, let's find the middle third of the private sector. And if you do that, that gives you a couple of hundred thousand businesses with revenues between 10 million and a billion dollars a year. Now, that's a big spread, it's two orders of magnitude, but it's the middle third of the private sector. And these companies are bigger than small and smaller than big. 
they also tend to be sort of like the legendary middle child, somewhat neglected, neglected in city halls, neglected in state houses, neglected in the halls of Congress. Um, and, 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 and their contributions to the economy aren't as well known as they should be. One of the things that we've learned over the eight, seven years, eight years, uh, of nine years now of the center's existence is that the middle market, this middle third of the private sector is the most dynamic part of the private sector. It occupies a sweet spot between resilience and runway. Resilience in the sense that it can take a licking and keep on ticking more than small businesses can, and runway in the sense that it has more room to grow than large businesses have. In the 2008-2010 financial crisis, we learned a bunch of middle market companies failed, not too many of them, but those that did not fail actually added jobs while everybody else was cutting. An example of that extraordinary resilience that the middle market has. Now, if you'll advance the slide, we'll see a, look, a, look, a little look at the middle market in Chicagoland. In Chicagoland, we're talking about 4,000 companies, 1.6 million employees, which you might think about as 1.6 million households and nearly a third of a trillion dollars in annual revenue. As you can see, it's divided across all industries of all types, heavy weighted to manufacturing um, uh, in Chicago, in Chicago land, as well as to uh, uh, as a lot of wholesale trade as well. As you know, Chicago is a distribution hub for, for the entire nation. And as you also know, Chicago land is the epicenter of middle market finance. And, and so there's an awful lot of impact of, of the middle market on Chicago and an awful lot of impact of Chicago on the middle market as a whole. The last few years, we've been pulling together a report for the Chicago Land Chamber about business in the middle market using pulling together data from our quarterly middle market indicator, culling out the Chicagoland companies and putting together their performance. I'm gonna give you just a few moments of those data because the world has changed. These data were collected in the first half of December, 2016 and, and in the year before so that they, they demonstrate the performance of middle market companies as of the end of the calendar year, basically, and the prospects that middle market companies in Chicago felt as of the beginning of the year. So it's a sense of the state of play before all of this pandemic horror began. So I'm gonna give you just a little bit of that, and then I'm gonna, we're gonna go into a couple of other issues, looking at some studies that we've done about how middle market companies have responded to disasters in the past, catastrophes in the past, that might give some indication of strengths and weaknesses in the current crisis. Uh, we're gonna look a little bit at supply chain and distribution, and we're gonna look a little bit at talent, which has been the number one, number one challenge of middle market companies in the recent past, I suspect right now it's cash and talent that are the number one problems. If you go forward one more slide, uh, this, is, this slide is basically an, uh, the overview, the high level overview of how Chicago's middle market completed the year 2019 and how it was looking forward to the year 2020 before the pandemic crisis came upon us. As you can see, Steady revenue growth. Chicago lands middle market companies grew on the top line 7.2% a year, the same as they did last year. A little bit better than the Midwest uh, and better than the Mid Midwest middle market generally compared to the year before, and a little bit worse than the national middle market as a whole. That's a pattern that we've seen that the, the Southeast and the West have been particularly strong in the middle market. Uh, the Midwest and the Northeast, not quite so strong, but that was a solid performance last year. But you'll also see that last year in the first column there, the revenue forecast, last year, middle market companies forecast that they would grow 5.5%. This year, their forecasts were lower. What we saw through the entire year last year was expectations slowly going down, not just for Chicago land companies, but across the country, as people felt that this very long economic expansion, the longest in history, was perhaps flattening out, still expanding, but not at an accelerating rate and expanding at a slower rate. So a lower revenue forecast. Now I should 
point out that obviously all these forecasts, every company that we talk to is thrown away its revenue forecast for the rest of 2020 and is figuring out, you know, zero based budgeting and, and is figuring out things from now. But that's the state of play. People were already a little cautious, having, however, thrown in a very good year. On the employment number, nearly 5% growth in payrolls, stronger than last year, and a strong hiring forecast. Now, I suspect that that number has dropped dramatically over the last few weeks, but we'll see. And you'll also see as you go across the board there that Chicago and middle market companies forecast employment growth just about the same as the national middle, uh, national middle market and had employment growth that was pretty close to the national middle market. So let's go for, so that's sort of the overall picture of what we saw. The report that we've done has much more detail. Um, it's just released today. It'll be, uh, the chamber will be sending, will be broadcasting that or letting, letting you know that information. You can also find it on our website, which is middlemarketcenter.org. And it'll give you a sense of how business was and the strengths and concerns that companies had coming into the present crisis. Now let's move the slide forward a little, uh, one more. A couple of years ago, we did a study of risk and resilience in the middle market. We did this just after the October in which there were wildfires in Chicago and hurricanes Harvey in Texas and Irma in Florida. And we explored three kinds of disruption in middle market companies. And I'm sharing these data with you because they might suggest some of what we might be seeing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, hurricanes and fires are different. A hurricane will shut things down for a week and then you have two or three or four weeks of cleaning things up. This is going to be longer, deeper, more and 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 less and na nationwide, not as not as regionally focused as a hurricane. So I don't know whether this analogy is going to be good, but the analogy is there and it's the best we can get. One of the things we saw is we looked at three different kinds of disruption. Strategic disruption, you make a huge strategic blunder, a catastrophic M&A, or there's a big disruptor, disruptive company that comes into your business. You know, Warby Parker comes into the eyeglass business, whatever it might be. Operational disruption, catastrophes, hurricanes, plant fires, a supplier goes out of business, whatever it might be, or digital disruption, a cyber attack. And if you take a look at the operational disruption, one of the things that you see, I mean, the thing that I think is most striking to see is that recovery rate. 77% had recovered completely by the time we talked to them a few months after, presumably a few months after those events had happened. A better rate of recovery than from the other kinds of disruption. Um, so that's the good news. The good news is that when this stops, if, uh, you know, it's, it's easier to restart operations than it might be to recover all of the loss of your intangibles with digital disruption or recover from the kinds of strategic blunders that companies might often make. Nevertheless, this is going to be bigger. This is going to be deeper. This is going to be longer. And so those numbers are probably going to look less good than, than, they, did, than they did in this report that we have here. Look at the next slide. And at the next slide, we took a look at, we, we asked where the impacts fell most um, uh, for the different kinds of disruption. And if you look at that middle column there, the operational disruption, you see three things that stand out. Operations, obviously, that's where the impact comes first. People, a huge impact on people, more a bigger impact on people than on anything than, than, than the other kinds of disruption have, and on supply and distribution systems. So as you're thinking about where you want to focus, obviously you want to keep your company in a position so that you can resume or continue operations as best you can. You want to very much look to your people and you want to think very much about what's going on with your supply and distribution systems. And if you'll remember back to our portrait of the Chicago land middle market, supply and distribution is a pretty crucial part of the middle market in Chicago land. With that, let me turn the microphone over to Doug, who will take us through a few point a few points about supply chain itself and how you, how you manage supply chains uh, and deal with disruption and create resilience for them. So Doug, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Next slide, please. So supply chain, um, certainly as we're going through this unprecedented situation, uh, many of you are probably hearing a lot about supply chain issues, whether it certainly 
is impacting the healthcare industry, but even in uh, you know daily staples like toilet paper, paper towels, um, all these types of things. And the middle market is certainly unique. Um, we have done quite a bit uh, in the area of middle market supply chain. Uh, one, because we know that middle market companies play critical roles in the supply chains of many uh, larger companies as well as their uh, peer middle market companies. We're also blessed to be located at a business school at the Fisher College of Business that has for years been known uh, for its strength uh, in both logistics and supply chain. So we've been able to leverage that in terms of uh, our faculty expertise, uh, the relationships that we have in and around Ohio and, and nationally as well. So let's first talk a little bit about resilience and how it may differ a bit from uh, risk management. So you see here at the top, you know, risk management is certainly uh, critical um, in identifying, assessing, and planning to mitigate any potential uh, issues that pop up. When we talk about resilience, we're actually um, more focused on also having the flexibility to deal with unidentified risks and uh, this uh, coronavirus uh, situation would certainly qualify. What we know about middle market companies is they have some very unique capabilities. One is nimbleness. Um, their size allows them to have, you know, the type of resources to quickly react. Um, they're not constrained necessarily like big companies uh, in, in taking a long time to shift and, and make decisions. They also have strong employee loyalty. We know these companies on average are about 31, 32 years old and a lot of their employees tend to stay with them uh, through the course of their careers. So that is also a strong capability. And then a lot of them focus on innovation. Uh, they invest time in looking at new ways of doing things and, and uh, how they can um, improve their operations. However, on the flip side, they're also vulnerable. They may not have the type of influence over their suppliers and customers. Um, like we look at you know, studies of big company supply chains. Usually that big company has a lot of that influence and middle market companies may not. They also may lack access to capital. They may also have limited liquidity. So essentially, how can companies take a look at their own supply chain resilience and really know where they stack up? If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, again, we're fortunate in that we um, uh, worked back in 2013 uh, with a few of our faculty members, uh, Keely Croxton and Mike Kniemeyer, as well as a uh, PhD student, Michaela Poliviu on a project on supply chain resiliency assessment. Um, so this is a tool that we have built and it resides on the center's website. You can see the link at the top of the page. And we've been collecting data over the last seven years uh, on companies um, of all sizes, all industries. So you can see here just by entering your industry, your location and your size, uh, and then answering a series of questions, which I'll review here shortly, we're able to actually provide you where you stand in terms of your own company's resilience. So let's take a look at those questions if you could advance the slides. So I'm not gonna read all these, but if you just start on the left, um, really what we're doing here is uh, companies can go and answer these questions and assess both their capabilities and vulnerabilities. So this is the Scram tool. Uh, again, if you look on the left, we're gonna look at things like what are your production capacity? Uh, what are alternatives for sourcing and production? Uh, as well as looking at the environment. What is your own brand equity? How loyal are your customers? What is your um, ability to look out at the state of the business environment? If you go to the right side, similarly, um, you can assess your own vulnerabilities. What is uh, the demand uncertainty uh, for, your, for your industry or your customers? Um, what are the different constraints that you might have on production, sourcing, supply? And then uh, what are your outsourcing dependencies? All things that can be disrupted uh, in a heartbeat as we're seeing today. And all of these questions are on a five point scale. So a five point Liker scale, uh, strongly agree to uh, strongly disagree and everything in between. And, uh, but just by entering the answers to these questions, uh, you then get the results. So I'm gonna show you an, exa an example on the next slide. Uh, this is a, the output for a manufacturing firm in the 50 to 100 million revenue range located in the state of Illinois. Um, I went through and answered those questions just hypothetically uh, with moderate risk balanced by proper capabilities. And you can see the heat map that gets produced. So essentially, um, if I can explain this very quickly in the middle, uh, everything in the green 
So from a negative 12.5 to the positive 12.5, that would be a company that's in balanced resilience. In other words, the capabilities are matching the vulnerabilities. You can see that uh, by the output here. To the left, erosion of profit would be where you, your capabilities that your company has invested in aren't quite matching up with the areas that you're vulnerable. So again, you may be overspending in areas that aren't quite necessary. Similarly, on the other end of the scale, um, exposure risk, that's where you really don't want to be when you've uh, ignored some of the vulnerabilities and are, are potentially exposed. So again, looking at uh, the output of this, what can middle market companies do? One, they can build stronger relationships with select upstream and downstream supply chain members. So again, being very strategic on who you want to build stronger relationships with to help cover those vulnerabilities. Two, potentially forming strategic alliances with competitors will allow a lot more flexibility. Um, also, forming a team within the company to constantly assess this resilience, uh, something called the risk register. So, you know, frequently going through and answering these questions and seeing what has potentially changed in your supply chain over, chain over time. For focusing on those uh, core competencies that you can uh, avoid uh, diversions of your resources. Five, innovating your own core competencies so that you're agile. And six, again, capitalizing on that employee loyalty. Uh, again, all these things helpful in times of uncertainty and uh, certainly unidentified risks like we're dealing with now with uh, COVID-19. Tom, back to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Doug. And one of the things I think about this is that this taking this survey right now might also be a map about <laughs> if things haven't broken yet, this survey might also suggest where you are most vulnerable and most need to fix. Well, most thing need to fix things or or look at things for the current environment, but also then prepare things for the future that will come. The last point that Doug mentioned was employee loyalty. And if you'll advance the next slide, I just want to talk for a couple more minutes before passing on about some of the things we're seeing about talent. Um, in Chicagoland, uh, and these are Chicagoland numbers from, from the report, um, if when we ask companies about their biggest challenge, um, in ch uh, core business issues in 2019, competition, growth, and so on and so forth, were just above talent. Uh, but in 2020, talent and the talent challenge rose to the top by a substantial margin. The biggest issue that all of you were facing and you were hearing it all the time was, I can't find the right people. I can't find enough people. I can't find people with the right skills, so on and so forth. So talent was the number one issue. Right now, as I said at the top of this, I suspect that for many of us, cash is the number one issue and keeping operations going forward. But I want to remind us that talent has been the number one issue. It's going to return in different forms. We may not have an, a shortage of people looking for work, but we're certainly going to have some of the skills challenges. And those skills challenges might have changed and become more severe because of the impact of the coronavirus. So as you're thinking about getting through the night, don't forget about thinking about getting through the night with the talent you need and the talent you're going to need as you're going forward. On the next slide, you can see some of the things that we learned from middle market companies about the areas of talent management and talent planning where they thought they were good or thought they were not so good. And what you can see that in, except in this area of motivation, in almost all these other areas, fewer than half of middle market companies rated their companies be, as being, half or fewer, rated their companies as being excellent or very good at any of these important capabilities. I see, you know, I want to particularly point out that one at the bottom, having the recruiting power to find people with the right skills, because that's going to come back to bite us all in the next few months. And keeping talented employees is also going to be important. Tough decisions are going to have to be made. And I always hate hearing that phrase, tough decisions, because the tough decisions are usually made at the expense of employees. But maybe we have to be thinking about what tough decisions we have to make in defense of the talent we need going forward because we're going to need it because this is going to end. These were actions, if you look in the next slide, that executives were thinking about to increase retention among the Chicagoland companies that we saw. We'll see this, um, you know, we'll, 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 uh, 
Uh, you can see this all in the report. But I want to just highlight flexible work arrangements as one of those things that people were thinking about because we're all dealing now with flexible work arrangements, whether we want to or not. As we've been thinking about this, I mentioned we're all working remotely right now. Understanding how to work remotely and how to manage virtual teams is a skill that is hard to find. Big companies have often been practicing it because they have multiple divisions, multinational, multi-time zones, and they often have virtual teams. But virtual teams are new for many middle market companies and they may not have the skills. On the next slide, please. Yesterday, Monday, uh, we recorded a podcast with a woman named Jessica Lipnack. And if you look up, the, uh, uh, and Jessica is the author of a book called Virtual Teams. She's been, this book was published 23 years ago. Jessica has been an expert on managing virtual teams for more than a generation. And these are some of the insights that you can find on that podcast. The URL is there, uh, or you can just find it on our website and go to the podcast section. But these are like six key insights from that conversation. First of all, don't spend so much time getting hung up on what technology you want that you forget to get the work done and get the sociology of it right. The sociology is more important than the technology. Second, these teams need to bring out your project management skills. Get the team together and redefine what the team's job is. What are we trying to do here? Get that explicit again because you need to do it and you're going to need to do it in, a, in this new language of virtuality and decompose that into what needs to happen today, this week, this month. Have a daily huddle. Our team at the National Center for the Middle Market gets together at nine o'clock every morning for half an hour and we have coffee and tell stories and figure out what we're gonna do. Communicate and document. Documentation is very important for virtual teams. Clarify roles and responsibilities. Managers are gonna have to play a lot more of a coaching role. You need a facilitator. You don't, probably somebody on your team has facilitation skills and now is her or his chance to shine with those things. Rotate roles. There's a note taker role that needs to be filled. Don't have the same person be the note taker every time. Give that person a chance to talk as well. So rotate some of those roles and keep everyone engaged. Managing time is important. You've got to allow people to work offline and online to work asynchronously the way they would across multiple time zones. What you individually and your team need, can do is find a rhythm where I can isolate, be heads down and focus very hard on a document in front of me and then come back to the team and say, this is what we're working on. This is what I've come up with. So isolation and communication. Remember the outliers. People who are still, the old, in the old world, it was the people who were remote, virtual, who envied people in the office. Now it may be the other way around. So help the people, help people connect, help the outliers wherever they are. Recognize that some people have language issues or disabilities and working virtually may be harder for them. So think about that and think about people who may have limited home technology. And finally, keep happy. I mean, study after study documents the fact that remote dispersed teams can outperform teams in the office. So if you do things right, it's possible to really get tremendous work and keep engagement going forward with the team, no matter where you are, but you're going to have to bring in some of these social skills as well as the technical skills of keeping people connected. With that, um, let me pass the baton back to uh, the folks at the, at the Chicago Land Chamber so we can go to the BMO, uh, BMO people. Thanks very much. All right. And now uh, we welcome Michael Stritch, Chief Investment Officer and National Head of Investments for BMO Wealth Management, and John Burchard, Senior Energy Materials and Industrials Analyst with BMO Wealth Management. Welcome. Great. Thanks. And good morning, everyone. This is Mike Stritch here. Uh, John, you want to say a quick hello as well? Hi, John. Uh, nice to be with you. You know, we thought... Um, we thought maybe we would take a different approach this morning, and, and by that I mean instead of putting together a, a host of different slides and things, we, we've kind of outlined a, a couple of uh, key topics that are on our minds, I'm sure are on your minds, and, and John and I will have a conversation about those. We'll provide some uh, kind of concluding remarks and then you know, move quickly to the uh, Q&A section, as I'm sure there's many things uh, uh, that you'd like to ask us and, and uh, the rest of the speakers as well. 
Let me just start with uh, a quick plug for an article that was in the Wall Street Journal today, and it um, it, it uh, and is, in, is in line with the closing comments uh, about working remotely and uh, people's stress levels and just the emotional side of what's going on. It was, uh, I think, a nice summation of some of the behavioral biases that exist in these type of environments. So if you haven't read it, it might be worth a quick read. It's it, the name of the, the title of the piece is "This Is Your Brain on a Crashing Stock Market." And uh, it really just highlights the idea of isolation in these situations uh, with the negative news that's out there uh, tends to skew people decidedly negative and can impact your decision making adversely. So it's something from a behavioral standpoint to, uh, to really watch out for, I think, personally and also for, for all of your employees. So we don't, have, we don't have a sight line into the presentation that's on the screen right now, but um, if we can pull up the market returns page. Uh, you know, not to be the uh, state, stater of the obvious here, of course, uh, but it's good to set up a little context. I want to go through a couple of things um, on this page. This is just a, 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 a database that we keep updated, uh, of course, periodically. Uh, rather a timely call today. Today is the uh, 19th of March. You can see the left-hand column of uh, this page is the uh, 19th of February, which marks the peak in the S&P 500. And it's been uh, a wild month, to say the least. It's hard to believe that was only one, one month ago, actually, as we sit here this morning. But you can see, um, you know, decidedly negative returns across the world, um, across sector even. And this is as of, uh, you know, just a few days ago. So they've changed dramatically even since then and will change uh, a bit more uh, today. Even safe havens, if you look on the bottom right-hand side, they're like gold. Or even on the left-hand column, if you look at real estate, uh, things that were traditionally sort of areas that investors flock to in the face of adverse situations have, have sold off. So the selling has been widespread. It's been, uh, dare I say, almost panicky here in the last uh, handful of days. And, and I bring that up because um, while it's very difficult to, to go through and emotional, it is also part of the process. And uh, that could sort of set the stage for the trough in the market as the, as the market does look look forward uh, and as a forward-looking mechanism, we would expect this to be the majority of the damage that's done, and I'll make a couple of uh, comments at the end on that. But uh, needless to say, the last four weeks have been, uh, have been very difficult. So if we flip to the next page, here's, here's some of the, the topics I think that we want to talk about. Um, I'll cover some of the latest uh, statistics on the virus itself, some comparables, what's going on on the policy front, and then John uh, here we'll talk uh, a bit more about oil prices and, and some company insights that we're seeing, and then, then we'll wrap up maybe with a uh, more of a personal point on uh, what we're recommending for uh, our clients and advisors in terms of navigating this. So let me start off by talking about the virus itself uh, quickly. Just uh, again, you probably are aware, but to restate, you know, the trends have been um, not good outside of China. We're running at about 15,000 plus cases per, per day, um, new cases per day, and, you know, that is a big number, but it also is um, built on two premises. One is, of course, the spreading globally of the virus, and two is we've entered a new phase of testing in the Western world, in the U.S. in particular. Uh, in the U.S., you know, that, that there is more tests available. There's still, uh, you know, there's still a disparate sort of operational elements. This Some people are getting it fast. Some people are slow, but the prioritization has started, elderly, first responders. And so we would expect these numbers uh, to continue to rise in the immediate term. But that's setting the stage again for uh, long-term flattening the curve type of outcome that everyone is shooting for and what the protocols that have been put in place around the country are meant to, uh, to help mitigate sort of a prolonged and really over-the-top over explosion in cases. And on that note, um, I think we can look to uh, to Asia for some for some green shoots here for some uh, light at the end of the tunnel data. Again, I would say a historic day as we sit here on March 19th. Uh, today was the first day, in fact, that um, the epicenter of China has announced where it all started has announced uh, no new cases uh, for the first time, and uh, all 34 cases that originated in China yesterday were actually imported from outside the country. So 
Uh, a milestone has certainly been reached there, and that's encouraging for the rest of us, and, and it's part of the reason why, uh, you know, governments around the world, again, are taking more drastic measures to, to lock this down. There is, there is a path to controlling. And if I, if I think about the timeline for China, maybe because I know a lot of people, our clients, and certainly are, are many are asking sort of what's the timeline that could be expected. And I don't pretend to have any uh, significant insight into that from a medical perspective, but I would just say that China went into lockdown on January 23rd, um, maybe the, you know, a handful of days into the, uh, into the outbreak in a significant uh, manner. Cases in China then peaked on February 17th. So you're talking about three weeks. And fast forward a month later, there were now no new uh, cases reported in China that stemmed internally. So if you think about that in the U.S. context, uh, and we are far from uh, probably ever going to be in a position to do exactly what China did from uh, the severity of the lockdown and the significance of it, but we are seeing, you know, quarantine measures much more aggressively this week. If you fast forward three weeks from now, that puts you in early April, and one month hence would be in early May. So for what it's worth, that's just a guidepost as to a potential sort of best case uh, if we draw on the example of China specifically. But again, that may not be a perfect example uh, because uh, some of the measures that they've taken were a little more aggressive than those that we're likely to take. But nonetheless, it does show it can be uh, contained with, um, with proper precautions. Italy is also showing uh, some signs of promise. I haven't had a chance to check the numbers this morning, but as of yesterday, if you were to draw a line of the caseload in Italy, it is starting to, the, the, the uh, growth is decelerating which you know, could ultimately maybe mark a, a turning point there as well. So some, some positive news at the margin uh, out of Italy as well. Again, another country that's taken some, some pretty uh, significant measures to limit interaction uh, and the like. Quick comment on the fatality rate. Again, it's, an, it's a widely circulated number. I'm not a doctor, again, and this is not medical advice, but from all of our research and talking to many people in the medical profession, um, the fatality rate, of course, is conditional on a number of things. Of course, uh, the healthcare system, population, age, and the like. Uh, our best guess at this point, looking at the data, is that it's probably somewhere between, uh, you know, 0.6 percent to one and a half percent. We do we do think South Korea is a good model to follow in terms of um, keeping an eye on the uh, fatality rate there. They are a country that has done a nice job controlling the, the outbreak too, not as draconian measures as China as well, um, and. And they're testing a significant number of people, and they have been for a while. So the data set is, um, is good there. And they're running right now just under 1%. So, again, just a, if you're going to look to a number in the, in the press, uh, I, would, I would encourage you to take a look at uh, the South Korea data. Uh, some other questions that may be coming up on people's minds as it relates to the uh, big things that we're watching, um, you know, is, is the idea is will the case rates, can they stay low in Asia now that there's been – progress in a number of countries as people return to work and the like. Something that everyone will be watching is, is will they stay uh, low or is there a second outbreak that uh, is on the horizon? So that's something unsure uh, what the path will be there. Um, another question that we get often from clients is about children. Um, you know, of course, it's un unclear at this point if they are uh, carriers, even though they don't seem to get sick that much, hence the school lockdowns around um, the world. So that's uh, an area that there's been a lot, there's a lot of research on going at the moment. And then, of course, uh, you know, there are, has been a lot of progress on a cure, vaccine, or therapeutic, or otherwise. Uh, it's going to take time, though, but there are companies, of course, working around the clock, and every day comes with new stories of a potentially beneficial uh, treatment. Uh, you know, perhaps it would be repurposing of an existing drug, which has been tried in mass, or there's also been some headway on new vaccines, but those will take much longer on the vaccine front to get uh, into production. We'll see. I think the president is supposed to have an announcement today around the FDA, some, something going on there. We'll see if there's any significance as it relates to that uh, later today. And the other thing, uh, that last thing I'll end on the case, on the um, virus itself, seasonality does look like, I've seen a number of academic papers, spoken with a number of um, practitioners. Uh, there is a, a, a potential that the seasonality impact could be underestimated in some of these forecasts and that, that it could be uh, as we move to a warmer climate, actually, that would have a bigger impact on curtailing the spread of the virus than people uh, maybe initially thought. So that's a positive trend. The trick is, in the interim, 
cities like Chicago, New York, and the like are in the in the you know in the perfect band of weather as we sit here right now in in uh, kind of late winter, early spring. Uh, moving on to some other things on our mind, comparable events. We've been looking all over to try to find are there comparables throughout history that, uh, from an economic standpoint, that would be relevant. Hard to find one, uh, to be honest with you, whether that's the SARS outbreak in Hong Kong, the global financial crisis, Eurozone debt crisis. We've looked at all these things. We've done a lot of scenario testing. Um, this one is uh, very unique in the sense that it's not only a, a supply disruption, it's also a, a significant demand uh, shock, which is happening uh, right now as you're feeling, I'm sure, and, and everyone else is feeling. Uh, just some numbers, though. You know, if we think about manufacturing, global financial crisis, many of you, I'm sure, uh, ran your businesses through that. Uh, I think that, you know, it was about a 15% decline in output cumulative or two quarters of maybe 6 to 7% uh, declines. Not unreasonable to think a similar situation could be at hand here. Consumption is the bigger one, probably, that um, could decline more in the short run. Um, I think the global financial crisis, again, saw a couple of 5% quarter-to-quarter uh, -quarter declines that, that could be um, understated for this event. So uh, right now it's difficult to really gauge uh, with any precision what the impact would be. But, you know, if there's, there's one, one research house that we read said that uh, the consumption decline might be similar to that seen in the Korean War in the late 19, uh, at the end of the 1940s, early 50s, which puts you into uh, almost, a, you know, almost a 10% decline in uh, consumption in the short run, right? That's a short run number here as we talk about the next, the next quarter. Um, policy responses have been fast and furious. I'm sitting here in, in my office in Chicago and I've got reams of paper that show all of the responses that the governments around the world are enacting. We saw another move last night by the Fed um, on the monetary side to shore up money markets in the, in the uh, extent that there's pressure there. Uh, the ECB came out last night with a bigger package uh, of, of purchases as well. So the good news is monetary policy is reacting swiftly, whether it's interest rate cuts or backstop on liquidity. Probably still will be more to do. I think the Federal Reserve in the U.S. will likely have to go back to Congress, look for additional powers potentially to make sure the markets are shored up. But they're reacting much more quickly than uh, they did in the financial crisis and they're relying on that playbook, which is coming in handy, but may need to be uh, expanded upon as we, as we go forward. Uh, the really the big story is fiscal policy. What's going to happen there? What is the government in the U.S. going to do? Maybe a little bit slow out of the gates and now working uh, quickly to kind of come back with a bigger, um, a bigger policy than it was just passed um, yesterday. In fact, I want to give a quick plug for those interested. We are hosting our uh, a client call for uh, BMO clients this, after this afternoon, 1 o'clock Central. Uh, that call will cover more in-depth details on the markets and the economy, but we also have an outside guest, uh, a policy expert um, related to sort of the Washington story, what's going on in uh, Washington. If anyone is interested to uh, hear that view, and I know there's another call today with the Chamber of Commerce that has a similar um, lens. This would be uh, – for our, from our perspective, someone uh, external to the Washington uh, uh, system itself offering a, a kind of objective view on what might get done and how quickly uh, that will come. But that's going to be the key. And I think the, the, the takeaway there is, um, you know, are, is, there, is it a help only those in need or help everyone at this point? Because it's a balance between uh, precision and time. They need to act very fast. And to do that, you probably can't get as much precision as you'd otherwise want. And so that's, the, that's I think, the, uh, the, uh, the, the toss-up right now that's being weighed. Um, let me turn it to John really quickly to talk about uh, the other, what we call on this page, the other black swan uh, oil prices, right? Uh, that was another um, shock to the system in the midst of all this virus-related uh, uh, impact that really uh, knocked the market sideways a few weeks back. So I think many have sure have seen that, but it's, it's kind of forgotten now. But, John, when you, can you give us an update on, you know, oil and energy prices and specifically maybe OPEC as, OPEC as it relates to what's going on there and if there's any, anything that might be done in the near term to curtail supply? Sure. So, um, I mean, just for a little bit of history, in 2016, Russia, Mexico, and Kazakhstan joined with OPEC to form what was called OPEC+. Plus. And the objective of the group was to cut excess supply, reduce inventories globally to help support prices. So that agreement 
worked pretty good since then. Um, you know, you could say Russia didn't really do their part of the bargain and Saudi Arabia took up kind of the extra slack from other members. But all in all, the agreement was working well. Inventories were drawing down. And then we had the coronavirus come about in, uh, in China where it started. And, and Saudi Arabia and the other OPEC members wanted to cut about one and a half million barrels a day of production. Um, the Russian oil minister met with Putin and came back and basically told OPEC plus that Russia was not willing to participate in any further cuts. Um, and so following that, I think that was on the, the 6th of March and then on the 7th on the weekend, Saudi Arabia decided to go the other way and say we're going to have a price war and we're going to open up the taps and produce up to 12.5 million barrels of oil a day. So we went from thinking we were going to have a cut to also having a large increase in production and then the Russians said well fine we'll increase production too. So right now neither side is blinking um, and, and so the, the question is how long is this going to go on? There's also a question of can OPEC survive because the OPEC charter says that signature members like Saudi Arabia are supposed to protect each other on the price side and here Saudi Arabia is basically going against everyone else that are its peers and, and you have to ask if uh, countries like Iraq, you know, the survivability of governments and countries like that. So those are things to watch. Um, and on the price side, it's kind of fascinating. You're starting to hear price targets come out from some people as low as ten, five dollars a barrel that they're thinking oil could go to. We we came down to about twenty-two dollars yesterday, and with neither side blinking, and with the supply, um, with the demand side issues we're having, um, it, it's just kind of two shocks at once. It's two black swans. Uh, yeah. You know, the coronavirus, it, it, the problem is you just, we don't know uh, how much it's going to impact demand and just have traffic stopping it where planes not flying and it's a global phenomenon. And so it, it's really hard to figure out, but we, we'll probably see a larger drop in demand than we've ever seen at any other time in history. So those two things together uh, make it difficult to forecast oil prices, but the outlook isn't good and we don't know when we're going to get a response on the supply side from Russia or Saudi Arabia that could do it tomorrow or could go on for years. Yeah, I think last week I checked the um, you know, correlation between gasoline and oil, for instance, and, and you know, I think we were looking at somewhere gas prices going down into the 170, 180 range. If the, if the price drops further, that could be even further decline. And so I would, you know, as we think about going forward and post sort of virus acute pressure, that is a good tailwind for a rebound. That, that, that is low interest rates are as well. We saw a surge in refinancing activity on the mortgage side um, as people look to, uh, you know, cash in on the low rates and get themselves some more cash flow. And so energy decline, interest rate decline, both help support a consumption rebound uh, on the back end of this. But of course, we have to get through the trough. That's the big uh, the big question. What about the industries, uh, John? I know, and, and this is this is a middle market call, so these are not, uh, as, you know, big firms that, like like maybe the, the names that you're covering in the public sense. But what are you um, hearing at this point from just any anecdotes that uh, might be interesting to the audience from the the public names in some of the more uh, difficult spaces right now? I think the the interesting things we're seeing is that. Companies really across the board are, are drawing down credit lines. Uh, we're seeing cuts in share buybacks, so people are trying to put cash on the balance sheet. I think that's one thing. Um, because this is still all so fresh and new, we're not getting a lot of commentary yet from uh, across the board from industries, but airlines have probably been the loudest, and we're seeing massive cuts in capacity. Uh, most of it's been international, but more and more by the day. Literally, it's changing every day, the, the number cut. Um, Delta's today announced they're going to lay down a significant number of planes. I think it's 600 planes. Um, and so from a labor standpoint, you know, you're going to see a lot, a lot of people laid off. And it's hard with the airline industry because they're trying to get the government to give them cash right now. So they're going to make a lot of noise and, and try to look at, look bad. But, um, but it is a real kind of dire situation. Um, and, and we saw, you know, unemployment claims higher than expected today. Yeah. Um, so that's a number to keep watching as well. Yeah, and that's really the second order effect, right? This idea of the temporary demand shock with the virus, then the longer term impacts will really be how that unemployment and that credit picture emerges, um, because that that'll that'll dictate signif significantly how we come out of this on the back end, and, and we will come out of it. Uh, the question is, you know, is that a Q2 thing? Is that sort of end of Q2, Q3? 
and then what does that um, what does that rebound look like? And and um, maybe just in the interest of time, I know we want to make sure we have some some spot for questions. Uh, if we can put to the last page um, for for us and. Uh, you know, just a summary. You know, um, this is the tar table that we're that we're watching um, as it relates to just a, a very uh, rudimentary kind of uh, view on some of the different trends in place. And um, you know, we're seeing on the double checks, which is new because they were single checks originally, and then as it got so extreme, especially on the bottom right hand side, I mean, the psychological impact is extreme. Uh, tourism, travel, business retrenchment is becoming extreme um, stimulus expectations are also becoming extreme on the other end to help to help kind of cushion um, the blow so uh, if I can summarize we think there of course is some uh, difficulty ahead in the short run uh, we do think that um, the virus will come under control and that the second order impacts will be um, managed as aggressively as possible by governments around the world which will uh, lead us to suggest that a second half rebound here is going to be likely in some degree, and if it's not extreme in the second half of 2020, it could be uh, a 2021 phenomenon where the pickup is, is a bit more of a snapback. Um, and so that's uh, maybe I'll, I'll stop my comments from, from there and, and again just give a, a plug on our call later today if anyone is interested, 1 o'clock Central, you can get the information. Maybe we'll talk more about our view. We're going to talk more there about our views on an individual investor basis, just some things to think about doing. Um, at this point, plus have that uh, deeper policy uh, discussion as well. So I'll stop there and turn it back and see if we want to take some questions in the last few minutes. Hi, uh, this is Jack Lavin again. Thank you to our panelists, and we have several questions. And so I'm going to ask the questions and then throw it out to the panelists who can jump in and answer. First question is kind of um, – how, do, how will the challenges for middle market companies be different uh, in this crisis and coming out of this uh, uh, economic downturn be unique versus small businesses and large businesses? And as uh, uh, was just mentioned, Congress is looking a lot for small business and then the big airlines and big businesses are looking. How, how, will, this, how will the advocacy piece and other things be unique for the middle market companies and what can they do best to uh, help uh, get out of this crisis? Well, Jack, it's Tom. Let me, let me take a first stab at that. I, I think number one is that we find that overall um, middle market companies have less institutional support. So, you know, they, they're, they're small business loans that are available uh, through the SBA. There's nothing comparable for middle market companies. Uh, and so that's one of the ch one of the challenges that they face. Um, they are um, middle market companies tend to be financially conservative. One of the strengths that they have is that they worry about getting out over their skis. For the last year, we have seen in our in our studies that middle market companies seem to have been building up cash, whether it was cash for a safety cushion or for a war chest. They They've been they've been a little bit more cautious than than before about putting money to uh, uh, money away to invest. So so they may have some sort of cash cushions, but they don't. But they have less fewer options than they they don't have a government safe safe savior like the SBA, and they have fewer options than large companies for going out and getting an infusion of cash that they have. So they kind of have to like go into the desert, take them, packing a lunch and packing their own water in, in general. So I think one of the real advocacy opportunities is to make sure that some of these relief programs, debt forgiveness programs, extension programs, abilities to go on and just, you know, carry things through uh, that are provided for smaller companies are extended into the middle market uh, and also perhaps some advocacy for, with on, on, on the behalf of middle market companies with financial services providers or financial services regulators, again, so that they can get the cash that they need to carry through. Um, it was great to hear um, the prediction that we'll see a snapback in perhaps in the second half of this year. But, uh, you know, that, that can be a long time, that can feel like a long time for some companies. So those would be two areas I think. 
So uh, next question, we have a question from Jim Karras uh, from Colliers, one of our mid-market sponsors and a board member of the chamber. Uh, thanks to all the panelists in the chamber for putting this together, very informative. He asks about historically lower oil prices have been good for the economy. Why the change? I guess this would be a question for, for John Burchard. Sure. I mean, the lower oil prices will be good from a consumer perspective in the form of lower gasoline prices. You also probably sell more big trucks, um, which is not great from a green perspective. But from a job standpoint, I think that's the biggest problem to watch. Yesterday, Halliburton laid off 3,500 people in Texas. And so, I mean, that's what we're going to see first is, is that job loss in Texas, there's significant cuts to exploration and production companies' budgets, which then means service companies and industrial companies related to the energy industry that, that have that as an end market sales all get hit by that. So, um, you know, on a, as an order of magnitude, companies are cutting their CapEx by 50% or more versus last year uh, in Texas. And I think that's just a starting point if, if prices keep going lower or just even stay where they're at right now. So there's going to be a lot of job cuts. And in, in the past, that's impacted the industrial sector, which generally has you know, 10 to 20 percent of its revenues come from the energy group. Yeah, so I would just add to that that it was decidedly, I would say, net positive for years. Uh, and now it's maybe balanced to net negative for the U.S. And this is, you know, uh, there's no there's no exact precision to that uh, other than to say uh, I think it's maybe six to seven hundred thousand uh, people employed in the energy sort of, uh, you know, exploration production fields now because we've done such a remarkable job there uh, as, a, as a nation to sort of uh, become self, self-sufficient self um, and a big capex. Uh, part, part of uh, overall capex comes from the energy sector. And then, of course, there's fear of bankruptcies here. Uh, for these smaller firms and the impact on banks, and, uh, and et cetera. And one other broad thing I would say is that the U.S., because of the shale revolution that we've had, has become the world's largest producer uh, of oil. And so oil has always been an has been long been an import into the U.S., but we've been an exporter. And so that's also helped the U.S. balance of trade. And so if, if oil prices stayed here, you'd definitely see a rollover in production, uh, depending on the duration of, of prices being down. And so that could impact the U.S. from a trade standpoint as well. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, regarding the supply chain. I think this is probably for Tom and Doug. Um, many middle market companies are part of the supply chain for bigger companies, and you've talked about supply chain resiliency. Um, given the current economic conditions, what is the likelihood that competitors might form strategic alliances? And then a kind of a second part is, how may this change some of our supply chain logistics such as automate, automated vehicle innovation and those kinds of things. Uh, yeah, I, I can take this one, Jack. Um, certainly that was one of the recommendations um, coming out of um, our, our work with some of our faculty is that strategic alliances become much more critical, um, particularly if we start to see things like consolidation uh, within certain industries. I, I think one of the advantages, you know, big companies can always make shifts, whether it's moving their logistics and distribution from primarily truck to air or going uh, rail to truck. Um, you know, smaller companies, mid mid-sized companies are usually outsourcing those types of things. So uh, where they have much less influence and power within the supply chain to be able to make those types of uh, capability shifts that you know would normally bolster their supply chain, you might see uh, a lot more things where competitors say, "Hey, let's uh, let's partner up. Um, the additional volume will give us, you know, uh, more flexibility and more buying power uh, when dealing with you know maybe third-party logistics providers and warehouses and transportation and things of that nature." So that would definitely be something to keep an eye on in terms of autonomous. I mean, we've been, you know, this has been going on for years. I think companies have been testing autonomous vehicles, consumer, truck. I know the U.S. military has been looking, you know, at convoy type logistics for a number of years. Um, I think there's been some bumps in the road, uh, particularly um, with the, uh, the Uber incident that happened back in 2018. And that slowed down uh, the work a little bit. But I know there's a couple of companies out there that have successfully tested uh, short-term runs 
you know, less than 100 miles uh, on interstates um, with humans in the vehicle, but the, them being actually driven autonomously. So it appears like we're still a few years away, at least, from those things becoming commonplace. But driver shortages within the trucking industry have been around for a long time and have been getting worse. So I think there's going to be even more pressure um, given this situation on how to uh, innovate uh, within the transportation space. So we'll have one more question and then wrap up. Um, this one would be for Mike and John. Um, and I know I'm not, you probably can't answer specifically to BMO, but just more of a banking industry wide. Um, how will access to credit be uh, how will things change and how will this impact, you know, mid-market businesses and maybe small and large businesses, however you want to comment, and what kind of policy needs are, are need to come from uh, Washington, D.C. to help uh, the bank industry weather through this, which then helps our businesses as far as an access to credit uh, work through this crisis? Maybe, uh, maybe I'll, uh, John can start with some comments on some real sort of what, like, what the airline industry is an example or Boeing are asking for for specific references, and then I can you know, come back with just some uh, final thoughts. Well, at Boeing, I would say you know they're asking for like sixty billion dollars for the government, and they're saying we have seventeen thousand suppliers, and to support that supply chain, we need money, or else the supply chain could collapse. Um, so you know that's something to watch for. Um, I think from the energy space because access to capital is really moved from being small and medium-sized banks to larger institutions to then non-banking institutions stepping in and taking up a large portion of this high-yield debt. And so that, that pool of money has really been cut off. So what companies need to survive really is to see a low-cost loans available for the government. In, in the airline industry, maybe it's grants as opposed to loans because uh, we don't know how long their cash flow and how far down it's going to be, but but really we need to see low-cost loans made available to multiple industries by the government, I think, because access to capital is a big problem companies are complaining about right now. And I would just submit that, uh, you know, Germany recently had an announcement where they're backstopping, the German government's backstopping a lot of loans to the tune of somewhere up to, I think, 80% of the value, which um, you could see something like that maybe emerge in in the U.S., I don't know if 80% is even enough. We'd have to see potentially if there'd need to be, uh, you know, full full guarantee on the part of the government to, to make sure that financial institutions are willing, in aggregate, in mass, to to participate in situations with an uncertain uh, future at reasonable rates. So I think that's something that uh, we'd like to see uh, considered in terms of Washington and, and and the policy responses at some level. Um, the good news is banks as a whole, though, are much better capitalized and, and, and less leveraged than they were, you know, during the financial crisis and things. And, and that that's a point of stability that uh, did not exist previously. So, you know, from an overall structural standpoint in the system, uh, things look stable, even though the market swings have been volatile. Uh, they, they do look, uh, you know, companies are much better positioned to withstand the storm on the financial side uh, this time around. So uh, I'd like to once again thank our panelists, Tom Stewart and Doug Farron of the National Center for the Middle Market, and Mike Stritch and John Borchard from uh, BMO Harris Bank. Thank you again for being here today. I'd like to once again thank each of our uh, sponsors uh, for the Mid-Market mid Chicago program here at the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce, BDO, BMO Harris Bank, Aon, and Collier's International. To download a copy of our middle market survey or to find more information and resources about the COVID-19 pandemic, please visit our website at www.chicagolandchamber.org. In addition, Aon, one of our mid-market council members and sponsors has great resources. And I think if you look up on our screen, uh, they have great resources on COVID-19 and, and how to work with it, particularly uh, with their uh, company and industry. Um, if, and then secondly, if you're interested, uh, we are hosting a webinar later this morning at 10.30 a.m. Central Daylight Time with U.S. Senator Dick Durbin, who will be providing an update on the federal government's response to COVID-19. 
for details or to register, uh, visit our website once again at www.chicagolandchamber.org. I would encourage you all to uh, tune into that and hear from our senior Senator Dick Durbin, who's one of the top leaders uh, in the U.S. Congress and the U.S. Senate. So once again, thank you all for joining us this morning uh, for our Mid-Market Survey event. Uh, and please stay safe and stay healthy.